Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Please get cozy as we jump right into these Bigfoot and paranormal encounters. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and ding that notification bell. I post new videos every single day, and you'll be notified when they go live. Okay, let's get into it. Our story is one that intertwines love, nature, and an encounter so extraordinary, it seems lifted from the pages of folklore. My partner and I share a profound connection, not just with each other, but with the great outdoors. This connection was sparked under unusual circumstances in a remote forest where fate brought us together. As my car failed me in the middle of nowhere, their timely arrival with friends on that day transformed a moment of distress into the beginning of a lifelong bond. Over the years, our annual camping trips to that very spot became a sacred tradition, a cherished escape from our high-stress, fast-paced careers. Our approach to camping was intentionally simplistic. We sought the unadulterated embrace of nature, choosing the rugged confines of our SUV over the artificial shelter of tents. This nomadic style allowed us the freedom to traverse various trails each day, a new adventure. Each night, a different corner of the wilderness to call home. The stars and the moon were our constant companions, casting a serene glow over our nocturnal abode. And every trip culminated in spending a night at the very location where our paths first intersected, a spot that symbolized the serendipity of our union. However, one particular trip veered into the realms of the unbelievable, altering our perception of the natural world forever. It was on the fifth night of this trip, a night that began like any other under the tranquil canopy of the forest. The familiar nocturnal chorus of wildlife created a soothing background as we settled in. But in the early hours of the morning, an unsettling silence enveloped us, a stark contrast to the usual symphony of the night. This eerie quietude was soon accompanied by a pungent, musky odor, so strong and unfamiliar that it filled the air with a heavy, almost tangible presence. It was unlike anything we had ever encountered, a scent that seemed to herald something primal and unknown. As we groped for our flashlights, a sudden, powerful shaking of our vehicle jolted us into a state of heightened alarm. When we mustered the courage to look outside, our flashlights cut through the darkness to reveal an astonishing sight. There, in the dim light, stood a colossal creature, its figure casting a formidable shadow against the trees. It was the legendary Bigfoot, a being of myth right before our eyes. Its massive frame was covered in coarse, matted fur, and its eyes, reflecting our flashlights, conveyed an almost human-like depth and intelligence. Frozen in terror, we watched as this giant of the forest examined our vehicle with what seemed like a curious, albeit intimidating, demeanor. The sheer strength of the creature was undeniable as it rocked our SUV with ease, making us acutely aware of our vulnerability in its presence. Driven by a primal urge to flee, we managed to start the SUV and hastily retreated from the scene. Glancing back, we saw the Bigfoot standing motionless, its gaze following us a silent sentinel in the moonlit forest. This surreal encounter, lasting only minutes, 
felt like an eternity and left an indelible mark on our psyche. In the aftermath, our perception of our cherished wilderness was irrevocably altered. The forest, once a haven of peace and adventure, now harbored a respectful fear. A reminder of the mysteries and unknown entities that dwell within its depths. Our story, once centered around the simplicity of nature and love, now included a chapter of awe and disbelief, a testament to the unexplained phenomena that lie beyond the realm of human understanding. This experience, though terrifying, also instilled in us a deeper reverence for the natural world and its hidden wonders forever changing our narrative of camping and adventure. On to the next one. This happened to me and some friends about five years ago in a national park in Washington. The park has a backcountry permit system. You can't camp without a permit and we had to apply for this way ahead of time. We thought we'd see lots of people, as it's a popular park, but we saw almost no one the entire time we were there. At the time, I worked for a high-tech company in Seattle. A group of us decided to go backpacking together. We were all pretty avid outdoorsmen, some were hikers, and a couple of the guys were serious climbers. We were all seasoned and experienced outdoorsmen. There were seven of us all told. So, we finally got the permit and made our plans and were soon camped in a high alpine basin deep within the park. I'd rather not say exactly where this happened. It took us a good hard day to get in there, carrying all of our gear on our backs. We were tired, and after we set up camp, we built a fire and cooked dinner. It was soon dark, as it had taken quite a while to set everything up. We had a great spaghetti dinner, and were soon all crashed out in our tents, exhausted. I'll add that I was the only one with any kind of weapon. I had a large bowie knife and I slept with it under my pillow. I had a run-in with a black bear in Yellowstone and always carried that knife. The bear hadn't harmed me, just scared me trying to get into my tent, but I hadn't had any defense at all. So thus, the knife on this trip. This was before you were allowed to carry guns in national parks. I guessed it to be about 3 a.m. when I woke. I just lay there. Something had awakened me, but I didn't know what. Then I heard some scuffling noise and some low talking. I crawled out of my tent and found several of the guys up and talking in a whisper. I didn't even have time to ask when I heard it. From way off in the distance, I mean several miles away, we could hear a sound, for lack of a better description, sounded like an air raid siren. It was the weirdest thing you can imagine, being way up there in the wilderness, to hear a siren. But what was even weirder and what left me with a knot in the pit of my stomach was the fact that the noise was moving, was gradually getting closer, and whatever was making it had lungs like a freight train, if a train had lungs. Whatever it was had a huge set of lungs. It sounded miles away and yet was so distinct. It really filled the air. It had vibrations to it. By now, the rest of the guys were up and everyone looked concerned. It was a unique situation for all of us. And I remember I was the only one armed and not very well at that. A bowie knife 
isn't really much of a weapon in a deal like that. We kind of ended up bunched together, and someone said we should build a fire. So, we ended up grabbing some wood from the forest around us and put it with a bit of wood from our earlier fire. We built a fire, and some of the guys continued to gather wood, but no one would get far from camp. We used our headlamps, and it was kind of eerie seeing all the lights nervously moving around the forest while that noise just got closer and closer. By the time it was near us, it actually shook the forest. It was the most intense sound I've ever heard, and it brought shivers to the back of my neck, literally. Before long, it was really close to our camp, and it was so loud it made my ears ring. You could actually feel the sound waves going through the air. It was just this intense siren sound. It would go from low pitch to high and drop back down again. Everyone stood with their backs to the fire, and we all had big sticks, except for me, and I had my knife in my hand. When the creature got to the edge of our camp, it just went crazy. It stopped making the siren sound and started with a high-pitched screaming. Then it would stop and growl, then go back to the screaming. That growl was absolutely terrifying. It was deep and throaty and mean sounding. We were all scared to death. Nobody said a word. We all stood there white as ghosts. Once in a while, the fire would kind of die down and someone would grab some wood from the pile and get it going again. This seemed to enrage the creature and it would start screaming again. It then began circling our camp, and we could hear it breaking through the bushes and trees. It had to be large. I swear, I was so scared, I don't remember much except praying and standing there with that big knife held out in front of me. The creature circled and circled. It knocked down some fairly large trees, a good eight inches in diameter and one of those nearly fell on us. We just continued to stand there in a pitiful circle around the fire. I worried that we would run out of wood, and sure enough, it was about 5 a.m., and the last bit of wood was burning. I said to one of the guys that we needed a plan for when the wood ran out. The creature was still circling our camp. It had settled down some and wasn't screaming anymore. But from the way it was breaking trees left and right, it still seemed very angry. Once in a while, it would lob a small tree at us, trees too green to burn, and you could still see the roots. It had ripped them from the ground. So we made a plan, though it wasn't much of one. We hadn't had our headlights turned on as we wanted to conserve the batteries. We decided that when the fire was dead, we'd all turn on our lights and shine it at whatever the creature was, and keep shining the lights until dawn. We knew we could last because we all had fresh batteries, the trip having just started. If the creature wasn't afraid of our lights, well, who knows then? So, the fire died out, and we turned on our headlamps and shone them at the creature as it circled the camp. I was amazed at the energy it had. It hadn't slowed down at all. This wasn't much of a plan, but it was all we had. If it tried to attack, we agreed to light some sticks on fire. We'd go down fighting. A kind of pitiful plan, really. When we turned on our lights and shone them into the woods, the creature stopped short. We could now see a pair of glowing red eyes looking at us, and the eyes were a good eight feet off the ground. This scared the you-know-what out of me, and the eyes had no flicker to them. We hadn't seen any red eyes before. It was like it had just turned them on at will. It stood there, 
eyes glowing just out of the circle of our lights, then just disappeared. The quiet, the silence, its disappearance were all really scary because we had no idea what was going on. Was it sneaking up on us? The uncertainty factor was really chilling. If I tried to describe the fear that night in detail, it would be a mixture of hopelessness, chilling terror, and astonishment. Finally, I could see the first light of dawn as the sky to the east began to turn a pale blue. It was still a good hour before it was really light enough to see much, and by then we had all pretty much collapsed around the cold firing. The night had taken its toll on us all, but not one of us went to sleep sitting there. We just sat in shock. As soon as it was light enough to see, everyone got up and began breaking camp. There was no discussion about it. It just happened. Everyone was exhausted, but we put on our packs and headed back the way we'd come in. It was only a few hours later when we got to the trailhead and our cars going downhill and pushed by fear. We got out really fast. At that point, the sun was bright, and the night seemed like a weird dream. We sat down on some rocks and began talking for the first time. I made some coffee, and someone else broke out some granola bars and cheese. We ate like famished men, which we were. No one had any idea what to make of this except one guy who had been raised in the Pacific Northwest. He said, he knew what it was. He said it was a Bigfoot, and a very angry one, probably because we had invaded its territory. Would it have harmed us? Yes, he was sure of it. As angry as it was, it wasn't bluffing. After a bit of talking about all of this, we left and went to our respective homes. I don't think any of us has been back in that park since then. I know I've given up camping completely, and have no desire to be out in the woods. I still have an interest in the park and read the news about that area, and strangely enough, several hikers have disappeared in that part of the park since then. A couple of years later, I took it upon myself to contact a park ranger and tell her of our experience that night. She was very quiet, then told me, what she was going to say was strictly off the record, but that the park service had quit issuing permits for that section of the park and knew something strange was afoot. They weren't sure how to address the situation. Strange tracks had been found, and she herself had something black and huge stalk her while on patrol not too far from where our camp had been. She won't go into that area alone, and the park service now has prohibited anyone from going in there at all. She told me they've had two rangers transfer and a couple of seasonals quit, and she was trying to transfer also. I told her I understood how she feels. I myself have no desire to ever go there again. On to the next one. I am very excited to announce that on this channel we are offering membership. Now, I never want my subscribers to feel like I am paywalling content, so new videos will remain 100% completely free. The membership is a way for those who feel like they want to support me to do so and help the channel grow monetarily. What your membership gives you access, though, to are subscriber badges, which evolve with how long you've been a member, and you can watch your badge grow from a baby Bigfoot all the way up to a sage Bigfoot. Also, as a member, you'll get access to member-only emojis, which are these beautiful Bigfoot emojis. Again, I never want to paywall any content on this channel. I always want the content to be free because I love the community 
and I want you to enjoy your time here. But if you do wish to support me making this content, this membership is a way for you to do that. Thanks for listening, and on to the next one. In Marion County in Florida, this incident occurred when a Demole group I was a member of stayed overnight near Dunnellan, Florida. During my senior year in high school, we were staying on a house on a dirt road belonging to one of the Demole brothers' parents. My friend Ron and I were interested in photography, and we wanted to take some time exposure photos of stars away from the city lights. Somewhere around 10 p.m. or 1 a.m., Ron, another friend, and Rick and I went down the dirt road until we were away from the four or five houses on the road and took some time exposures on my tripod. I noticed a light from a nearby house was still visible, so I moved about 30 to 50 feet further down the road. Ron and Rick stayed put. As I put up the tripod, I noticed a foul stench coming from the woods nearby on the opposite side of the road from the houses. I asked Ron and Rick if they smelled anything, and they laughed, thinking I was playing a skunk ape joke on them. I said I was serious, so they moved toward me. One said he smelled it, and then Ron said, I don't hear any crickets chirping. I then became aware of the unusual silence. Ron and Rich immediately turned and ran to the house, I grabbed my tripod camera and followed. We got to the house and before going in, agreed to not tell anyone so they would not make fun of us. The next morning, before breakfast, the three of us returned to the area. We found the exact spot from where the trees blocked the house where the light I had moved to block came from and there was no smell. I pointed to an area where I thought the odor had originated but we could not see nothing from the road due to the thick underbrush and small trees. We walked up the road, had stayed on the road to orient us back to the correct area, and when we found him through the trees, the area directly where I had pointed to as the origin of the smell had a large four by five area of matted down underbrush. There was a hill going away from the road and a small area for runoff between the road and the hill that was damp. And in that damp area, we found a large footprint one inch deep, as I recall, about 16 to 18 inches long. Ron, an offensive lineman, weighed 275 pounds, barely left an impression next to it, so we knew what had left it was very heavy. I had black and white film in my camera, left over from the star shoot, and I took a few photos of the footprint. We planned to return after breakfast with color film, but the group left before we were able to do that, and we had no choice but to leave with them. It was dense wood on one side of the dirt road with a few rustic homes on the other. These were separated by woods as well. There was a slight hill on the wooded side of the road with a runoff area between the hill and the road where we found the footprint. On to the next one. In Orange County in Florida, on the Apopka Highway, a few years back, I lived in Plymouth, Florida. We lived in a wooded area. In the front of the house, there was an orange grove. Beside us was a swamp, and around that was a wooded area. I used to walk through the woods with my rifle just to feel safe. There was an old couple that had a farm across from the woods, I got to know them pretty well. I would go there for coffee. The old man and his wife would tell me stories about this Bigfoot. The farmer said that the Bigfoot comes into his garden and takes his crops. I said, oh really? I did not believe him. And that was that. Until one night, I was home alone with my puppy. We were sitting on the porch and you couldn't see three feet in front of you. I heard this noise breaking through the brush. I got so scared, I ran into the house, grabbed my rifle, and stood behind the front door. I could hardly move. Then I heard whatever it was go around the back of the house. It tried to get into the door. It ran out the front door into the orange grove. I kept on running. 
My foot got caught on a root of a tree and I fell. I rolled into the swamp and lost my rifle. I looked back and I saw Bigfoot. I got up and ran to the road. There was a truck that stopped to help. I called my friends. They came over and found the whole back door was ripped off. The farmer said to me, I told you so. I moved from there the next day at my sister-in-law's house. There are a lot of strange things out there. There are some footprints and calves that people go to see in Rock Springs. On to the next one. Northwest of Alexander Springs, it's a pretty dense area of wood and swamp. I used to work on CB radios and such, and occasionally a deputy would stop by my little shop at my house and we would shoot the bull. One night, a deputy stopped and said they had a Bigfoot sighting in the Ocala National Forest. And being the curious type, I asked where, and he told me. The next morning, I got a friend of mine and decided to go and see if we could find the print. We stopped at the hardware store, and I bought some plaster of Paris. Already had the buckets in the Jeep. When we arrived, we could see where casts had previously been taken, and we decided to look further. We drove further through the wood and had to go pretty deep to get to the other side where the road continued, if you wanted to call it a road. I stopped the jeep and we got out to look around, and lo and behold, there were prints coming from a clear-cut area where the trees had been cut down and removed across the sandy road leading into the swamp. It had stopped at the edge of the road and must have eaten bay tree blossoms because about 10 to 12 feet in the tree, you could see where it took the blossoms and there were pieces of the blossoms on the ground. The prints were about four to five feet apart when it walked and about one to two inches deep. As I walked or tried to walk in its stride, it was a stretch for me as I'm a pretty big man myself, six foot three inches. I actually put my foot in its print as I walked deeper into the swamp. The further I got, the deeper the prints went into the ground, and my foot and leg went all the way to my groin area. This thing was big. I took two casts, gave one to my buddy, and kept one, which I still have. There is no doubt in my mind, after seeing what I saw and casting the print, that this does exist. We had an eerie feeling that something was watching us. We had just had breakfast. I've talked to people that have sworn they've seen it that live in the area. I believe that it is still hanging around out there because hunters see prints all the time. On to the next one. It was in 2016 when I lost my dog Franklin. He was my best friend who also happened to be a French bulldog. I had him ever since I moved to Loveland, Colorado after college and we had experienced a lot together. My girlfriends, Jen and Michaela, knew he meant the world to me. So they tried to come up with a way to help lift my spirit a few days after Franklin departed from this world. The three of us had bonded over our passion for outdoor adventures, and they surprised me with a reservation to backpack in the famous Zion National Forest in Utah. It was a pleasant surprise, because it's known to be quite challenging to get a permit for that sort of thing. Usually, you have to get on a very long wait list. Luckily, Jen's boyfriend used to work in the park and had connections that squeezed us in pronto. I missed my dog so much, but the news that we were heading to Zion National Forest did help, at least to ease the pain. If I remember correctly, the whole trip was supposed to last close to four days. It was so hot when we first arrived late morning, but the temperature plummeted once the early evening rolled around. Michaela was an extra adventurous type. She's the kind of person who has no trouble with snakes and spiders and likes to venture off the beaten path. During dusk of the second day, one of the many small mountains caught her attention. She liked how it appeared to have a spacious flat area at the top and suggested we camp there for the night. Jen wasn't enthusiastic about pushing her way through a conglomerate of cactuses and desert critters, 
but obliged once Michaela essentially started begging like a child. A mysterious smell hit my nostrils. I was almost at the top. It was a very musky odor, yet it was unlike anything I had ever before experienced. But I just suspected that it was the desert breeze that kept coming and going. I hadn't imagined that it might have come from something dwelling beneath the rock. The soon-to-appear vast display of stars helped our minds pass the stinky smell. The constellations were by far the most visible I had ever seen them. And that's a bold statement because I'd already seen some miraculous night skies. I had a bit of trouble sleeping that night. It could have been because the ground had no give to it, but it was like I was constantly half asleep. I thought I heard some very unusual noises a few times, but I was used to that sort of thing from all my previous camping trips. If you're an avid camper, you know you'll inevitably hear peculiar noises after dark. It's just part of the game. I was awoken early the following day by the pleasant smell of coffee. Jen had brought me a freshly brewed bun while I was still curled up in my mummy sleeping bag. I remember feeling so grateful for that, but I noticed a somewhat discouraging look on her face as she sat above my sleeping bag. Is everything all right? I asked, mystified. It turned out Jen was frightened by something that Michaela had stumbled across during an early morning wander. She was the first to get up and climbed her way down the other side of the small mountain to check out the landscape. That was when she made a very alarming discovery. But it turned out it was much more frightening to Jen than Michaela. When I went outside the tent to greet Michaela, it was very evident that she was excited about what she had found. She acted like she had made some monumental archaeological discovery. Because of the contrast of her demeanor to Jen, I felt a lot more comfortable about the idea of going to check it out. Jen stayed back while Michaela and I carefully climbed down the boulders. Not long after we made it to ground level, she guided me to a crevice between the rocks. It was large enough for maybe two adults to squeeze through but I could right away tell that a few people would want to attempt it. It was nearly pitch black in there, even with the rising sun illuminating the surrounding landscape. There was no telling what kind of creepy crawlers could be lurking in there, or worse, a cougar. Something about that aspect elevated my perception of how truly courageous my friends were. For whatever reason, Michaela refused to inform me of exactly what she had found, she wanted me to see it for myself, and somehow she convinced Jen to allow things to play out that way. As soon as Michaela switched on her iPhone flashlight, I discovered why. She wanted to watch me jump after seeing the wall of skulls before me. But these weren't animal skulls. They were human skulls, caked with what looked like solidified mud or even clay. The closer I got to the wall, the more I realized that the substance was likely responsible for the stinky waft that grazed our nostrils the previous night. Oh my God, I gasped as I recognized it wasn't mud or clay, it was manure. The combination of poop and human skulls along with the remote desert wall suddenly became too much to bear. An internal alarm went off, insisting that we weren't safe. I think we should go, I whispered to Michaela subconsciously deciding that it would be wise to stay quiet. But my friend didn't seem to be on the same page. What's wrong, she replied. I know this stuff is creepy, but it's ancient. Whoever did this hasn't been around for long. Something caught her attention, stopping her mid-sentence. What is it? I asked. I couldn't tell what she was looking at on the ground a few feet behind her. A gross squishing noise then announced before Michaela that she had stepped in something nasty. I expected a small animal carcass left there by a desert predator such as the bobcat, but after I proceeded to stroll around my friend and take a look with a flashlight, I realized it was a massive mound of crap. It would have easily filled a medium-sized bucket to the top. It was only because the cave ceiling was so high that the odor hadn't made it unbearable to stand inside there. The poop had a swirl to it much like what you would see on soft ice cream cones. Still, 
I had yet to register the connection between the wall of human skulls and whatever had produced the giant pile of excrement. Michaela then shined her light further toward the back of the cave. That was when we both saw the other mounds of crap. Whatever had made them, it was apparent that it wanted them far away from the cave entrance. Something about seeing all those poop piles made the stench so much worse. Maybe you're right, Michaela said. Maybe we should leave. We were on our way out when we heard a strange grunt, which stopped us in our track. Although we couldn't see it yet, both of us could tell it was coming from outside the cave. Whatever it was that nestled there, it was almost home. When a shadow indicated that it was feet away from the cave's entrance, Michaela and I scurried far away from it, seeking what seemed to be a, the darkest spot along the inner wall. Another mound of crap almost caused me to slip after rushing toward the lame hiding spot before I could finish getting situated. I saw the shape of a figure that initially looked like a hunch man, but when it turned its head slightly to the side, allowing a bit more of the outside light to expose its features, I saw this was no man. It was a hairy, bipedal animal. I right away wondered how something that size managed to squeeze its way through the cave entrance. That part still fails to make any sense to me. It took every ounce of self-control to refrain from screaming. The idea that this man-like beast was responsible for plastering those human skulls onto the wall was more than my nerves could handle. Additionally, I worried about Jen's condition. I hadn't heard anyone screaming, so I tried to force myself to conclude that she was fine. Maybe she nor this desert troll had glimpsed one another. But would Jen have shouted out a warning had she spotted the creature approaching or would she have hidden out in fear that it might come after her? The more I considered that, the more it sounded like a suicide mission to have drawn any attention her way. At first, the creature appeared to enter its dwelling without noticing that anything was out of place. I felt surprised that it hadn't sniffed us out right away, especially given the size of its nostrils. Another thing I'd like to point out is how I didn't see any ears on the creature. Either there were none, or they were so small that the volume of hair on the sides of its head covered them up. I almost couldn't breathe due to the idea of it noticing us, but thank God it kept moving on toward the other side of the cave. Eventually, it was so deep that the darkness nearly rendered it invisible. That was when I felt Michaela's hand yank me by the t-shirt. I'm not sure what I would have done had she not been there to lead the way. I probably would have remained there frozen in fear. I probably would have remained frozen in fear. Before I knew it, we had made it back to camp and found Jen reading a book. She didn't even need to say anything to confirm that she hadn't seen anything unusual. Had she, there was no way she could have been sitting so casually with her legs crossed in one of the fold-out chairs. She began to say something when she noticed her approach. But we quickly silenced her with hand signals. There's something down there, Michaela whispered, after getting close enough. Yeah, I know, I saw them, Jen replied, confused. I was just down there with you. No, not the skulls, Michaela said, shushing her friend again. Whatever it is that attached the skulls to the wall is down there right now. What? What do you mean? After that, all Michaela did was give her a suggestive look that we needed to leave a quietly as possible. By that point, Jen could tell that we weren't messing around and she started assisting with packing up. My nerves told me it would be any second before that monster appeared atop the mountain. How could it not have heard us fleeing from the cave? I must have tried to convince myself that it wasn't interested in going after people, but of course, the collection of human skulls suggested otherwise. I almost couldn't believe it when we were headed down the opposite side of Colossal Rocks. Something about that felt too good to be true. We stayed quiet until we were maybe around 300 yards from the area. As soon as we stopped to evaluate whether our eyes were playing tricks on us, there was an entire group, or as I now refer to it, a clan. The sun's current position made it too hard to see whether they were looking right at us. Most of them moved about the terrain in the strangest ways. 
we watched two or three of them go up to the top of the boundaries where we camped, and it almost appeared as though they floated up there. I know that wasn't the case, but I suppose the agility of these things was on a whole other level. Although we couldn't see too well from the distance we stood, we saw more than enough to know that these things were not human. But we could say that a few of them carried what appeared to be sacks filled with only God knows what. Is there a chance that there could have been more human skulls inside those sacks? We debated crafting signs that would warn other hikers to go nowhere near the area. But it became difficult to think of anything other than getting as far away from there as possible. It's probably needless to say that we were all quite anxious for the duration of the trip. I noticed how that made all three of us edgier, causing us to bicker quite a bit. Fortunately, we didn't encounter any of those creatures during the remainder of our hike. A part of me thought we would be hunted down. We told the first park employees we came across what we saw, but she seemed very fresh on the job and was unsure of how to handle it. The details of the encounter were so strange that it must have almost sounded like we might have been trying to prank her. She informed us that she was the only employee left at the desk for the rest of the day, but that she would be sure to pass on the message. Sometimes I still wonder whether she actually mentioned it to anyone after we left. Looking back at the whole trip is very surreal. It's by far the strangest memory of my life, and I'd be devastated if anything tops it before the day I die. On to the next one. The story isn't long, but if it hadn't taken place, I wouldn't be here to tell it. It's one of those things that leave you wondering if you are in the right place at the right time or in the wrong place at the wrong time. I still scratch my head and wonder how it all came to be. My girlfriend Liz and I had planned a trip to hike in the Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. We were both students at a college in Kansas. And after the story took place, we eventually finished school, got married, and bought a restaurant. But at the time, neither of us thought we would live to see the next day, and many other people in the canyon didn't. 143 people died that night, and we were very fortunate we weren't part of that number. Five of them were never found. It was July, and we were both working summer jobs and had taken the afternoon off from work. We knew a spot where we could camp in the canyon down from Estes Park, the nearest way to Rocky Mountain National Park. We drove and drove and finally got to the canyon. It was crowded with campers and tourists, and many of the little motels along the highway there were full. But our little spot was empty. It was at a pull-off right by Big Thompson River, a really sweet camp spot, but you really couldn't tell it was there unless you already knew. That's why it was still empty. It sat right next to some jagged and crumbly cliffs. We put our tent up as far from the rock as we could as I get nervous about rock fall. I wanted to build a fire, but we were exhausted from staying up really late the previous night. So we decided to just hit the hay, even though it wasn't very late, maybe about eight. We needed to get up early the next day and get on up into the park where we had reserved campsites. We intended to spend the entire week camping and hiking. It's a beautiful place and we were excited to be in the mountains. I recall sitting on a rock and noting how little of the sky one could see as the canyon cliffs blocked most of my view. But what we could see was spectacular. Before long, a three-quarter moon rose over the cliff walls, lighting everything up. It was beautiful, but I had no inkling of what was to come. Though the great tendrils of cloud that began floating over the sky should have given me a hint, we crawled into our tent and were soon asleep. It was nice and cool and good sleeping weather. Last thing I noticed before crawling in was that the sky was getting cloudier. I hadn't been asleep very long when I remember thinking I was having a nightmare. I then decided it was Liz who was having a nightmare, as I could hear someone talking. 
I finally woke up and looked at my watch. It was only 8.45. I had been asleep less than an hour. A light rain was falling and Liz was fast asleep. I lay there for a while, listening to the rain on the tent and wondering what had awakened me when I heard the creepiest sound I've ever heard in my life. It was a siren far in the distance, but you could tell it was being made by something alive, some person or creature, not a mechanical thing. It's hard to describe, but it was just like something with really big lungs imitating an old air raid siren like in the movies. I just lay there listening, thinking I was dreaming as it kept getting closer. I finally started to panic a bit and woke Liz up. She lay there a while also, trying to figure out what was going on. Then she sat up in her sleeping bag. I'm getting in the car, she said. This is weird. I'm right behind you, I answered. We both stumbled from the tent and jumped into the nearby car, where I locked the doors and put the key in the ignition, ready to take off. I really didn't want to leave our tent and gear there, but I was ready to do whatever was necessary if this noise got any closer. We both just sat there, the windows open a crack, listening and trying to understand what we were hearing. The siren echoed and echoed across one side of the canyon and then back across the other, and as it got closer, I was amazed at how loud it was. It was truly surreal because we were in a place in the canyon where there weren't any motels or other campsites. We had no idea if anyone else could hear it or not. Where we were was pretty secluded. The siren sound was now really loud and sounded like it was very close. I freaked out and started up the car just as Liz started shouting something like, oh my God, look at that. I looked up just in time to see a huge set of glowing eyes right in front of the car, and these eyes were a good seven feet off the ground. Whatever it was, it had stopped making the siren-like sound and was now silent, just standing there in front of the car, glaring at us. There was no way I could go forward, and my reverse was blocked by the tent, with the river right behind that. I just sat there in shock, unable to drive away, and this huge creature just stood there, looking at us. Liz started crying, and I myself felt a bit hysterical. Now, with no warning, this thing began rocking the car up and down, and then started rocking it sideways, and I knew it was just a matter of time before it tipped us completely over. I knew then we would be stuck in the car and possibly injured. We had to get out, but there was no way we could with the creature there, as it definitely seemed to have it in for us and acted like it wanted to kill us. The car was bouncing around and I hit my head on the side window pretty hard and started bleeding. Liz grabbed onto me and pulled me out the side door, screaming and running, dragging me along with her. Now the creature stopped rocking the car and watching us as we started running down the highway. It soon ran along behind us and just as I thought it would reach out and grab one of us, it ran past us and stopped in front of us, looking really malevolent. It was huge, and there was enough moonlight through the clouds that I could make out a very heavy creature that appeared to be all muscle. Its head came to a sort of point or crest, and its arms draped down almost to its knees. It just stood there, blocking our path, eyes glowing like it wanted to kill us. I was still bleeding, even though I later realized it was just a surface wound, but I was disoriented. Fortunately, Liz was in charge and she steered me up the side of a cliff. Climb, climb, she screamed at me. And I can tell you, I did exactly as she said. We could see well enough to get up the cliff, although it might be more accurate to say it was more like a rocky rubble. Not sheer cliff, that we were climbing. We were soon a good 30 or so feet up and I turned to see the creature right behind us. Liz also saw it and we started climbing again, but had now reached an overhang that we couldn't get around. The creature stood there blocking our way. We just sort of crumbled into a sitting position, holding each other there in the rain 
and I could feel Liz's side heaving as if she were silently sobbing. All I could do was hold on to her and hope the thing would leave us alone. I picked up a rock and planned to use it if I had to, but the creature just stood there below us. And now I could hear a really strange sound, like rocks clattering together coming from the distance. At first, I thought it was a rock slide coming down the cliffs, but as I listened, I could hear that it was below us. It got louder and louder, and soon it sounded like a maelstrom of rocks and trees slamming together, and it wasn't much longer before I could see below us a raging river where we'd once seen a small and quiet creek. It was a flash flood, and we found out later that a thunderstorm had become stationary over the canyon high above, dropping over 14 inches of water into the drainage basin of this small creek in less than four hours turning it into a raging and deadly torrent 25 feet high. It had barely been raining where we were, so no one had any indication of what was coming. The creature turned and watched, just as we did, and then it soon bounded past us and up on the cliff, making no motion to harm us. It was gone in a moment, leaving behind a dreamlike memory that neither of us could really even describe just a huge, dark creature in the light rain forcing us up the sides of the canyon in time to save us from death. Many others died that night, not even having a chance to escape the floodwaters as the water was upon them before they could react. Liz and I sat on the cliffs all night in shock. Then, as morning came, we slowly climbed back down to the edge of the debris where the raging torrent had now become once again a small river now choked with huge boulders and dead trees brought down with the floodwaters. Our car and tent and gear were nowhere to be seen. It wasn't until afternoon that we were rescued by a group of searchers scouring the riverway for survivors. We went to a shelter and called home and Liz's parents came and got us. We were exhausted and in shock and slept for most of the long ride home. When asked how we woke and knew to climb the cliffs, we just said we heard a sound and got up. We didn't tell them what the sound was, and they just assumed we'd heard the flood upstream before it reached us. To this day, neither of us understands what happened that night. It almost seems to us that what we saw was a Bigfoot, that most elusive of creatures, and it also seems like it was trying to run ahead of the flood and warn people of what was coming. When it got to us, it knew we had to get out of the car or we would die. So it forced us out, then herded us up into the cliffs. There's really no other explanation for it. As once we were safe, it lost interest in us and bounded on upward and was gone. We were truly saved by a Bigfoot. Or was it just a coincidence? I can't answer that question, but I am grateful that it took an interest in us, although at the time, I was terrified and sure that it wanted to kill us. But without it, we would have both died that night. I'm sure of that. On to the next one. While riding my bicycle around Clam Lake in Cadillac, Michigan, I encountered an unidentified animal. The place was about a 40-minute drive from where I lived so I'd go there on occasion to see my old friend Stuart. Stuart and I were on our high school cross-country team back in the late 90s, and we've essentially used each other for motivation to stay active ever since. Coincidentally, we both started having knee trouble around the same time, so we decided to make bike riding our primary form of endurance exercise. The guy resided about half of a mile away from the beautiful Clam Lake, so I'd go to park my car at his place and we'd ride our bikes on over there. We had probably ridden around that lake about 20 times before ever seeing anything unusual. However, there was a time before our sighting that we heard a very eerie sounding cackle coming from the woods. We even pulled over to see if we could get a look at what was causing it, but no luck. We resumed our ride concluding that it must have been a large feline, perhaps a bobcat. They're known for making some pretty strange noises, especially in the middle of the night. 
maybe around 15 minutes later, we were forced to slow down to avoid colliding with something large walking across the path. The first thing I noticed was how it moved on two legs, and they were bent at the knees, just like you'll see on any canine. My initial thought was that someone's house dog was performing an advanced trick for their owner, but the closer we got, the easier it became to see that this was no small domesticated animal. It was anything but. The bipedal creature had primarily black fur with a faded grayish stripe that looked like a ridge along its spine. Its erect ears were so pointy that they almost looked sharp. It had notably long and chiseled arms topped off with appendages that compared better with hands than paws. I don't recall spotting a tail, but it could have been tucked between the legs for all I know. Maybe it's because I've seen too many werewolf movies, but something about this animal felt very human-like. It moved across the path with an almost dinosaur-like stride, and at first, it didn't seem daunted by our presence. But what's so weird is how it had nearly made it to the other side of the wood and out of sight when it turned and looked at us. Something about the way it stared reminded me so much of when meerkat pop their head when intrigued by something. That was when the head of this thing looked so much like that of a German shepherd. From where I stood, everything about those features looked nearly identical, except for the size. This creature was much bigger. If a credible scientist were to reveal that it's possible to splice human DNA with German shepherd DNA and birth an organism that could reach adulthood, I'd bet a pretty penny that that's what this thing was. The dog-like creature stared at us for somewhere around 10 to 20 seconds before resuming its stride into the woods. It must have been because another biker had come into view from the opposite direction of us, so maybe it decided it was outnumbered. However, it is hard to imagine that creature feeling threatened by a human. It would have taken a powerful gun to take that creature down. The creature didn't make any noise while it was visible, so I have no way of connecting it to those earlier cackles. But I have to say that it makes the creature even creepier if it was the one responsible. That possibility gives me the chill. It didn't take much investigating to conclude that we saw a dogman. I'm sure of it. What I'm not certain of is what they are. It would seem strange that evolution would create a bipedal animal with legs shaped like that. That seems to clash with adaption. I'm not the most religious guy, but I do believe there's something to all that angels and demon stuff. My first guess is that the creature was biologically engineered, but my second guess is that it's demonic. Even though it didn't approach us, nothing about it felt even a bit friendly. On to the next one. My extended family settled in Northern California multiple generations ago, and ever since then, we've owned a spacious plot of land near Round Mountain. The place was a dream come true for my older cousin Jimmy. He was extremely passionate about all off-road vehicles as a teenager and through his mid-20s. Since I was one of the only male cousins close to his age, Jimmy fully expected me to participate in all that stuff whenever we made our way up to his place. It seemed like it was always the first thing he did, even if it was dark and cold by the time we arrived. The incident I'm about to tell you occurred on Thanksgiving Eve of 2013, so the experience of it all is still pretty fresh in my mind. Jimmy was extracting a six-pack of cheap beer from the garage refrigerator when my parents and I pulled into the driveway. I didn't even get a chance to say hello to my aunt and uncle before Jimmy insisted that I get on his extra four-wheeler. The only reason I was somewhat pleased to get out of there right away was so that I could smoke a cigarette. It was a little less than a three-hour drive from our house to theirs, and there hadn't been a convenient place to smoke the one time we stopped at a gas station. The trail we went on had many overhanging branches, 
making it so we had to constantly duck our heads out of the way. Fortunately, Jimmy's lead made it easier to anticipate the obstacles ahead. The path seemed as narrow and bumpy as could be, and I remember my cousin shouting something out about how he was planning to smooth it out a bit in the near future. Eventually, we arrived near a body of water, but it was difficult to tell how big it was due to how dark it was. That area usually seemed star-filled, but that wasn't one of those nights. As I was finished with my beer and my cigarette, I heard the infamous tree knock. By Jimmy's facial expression, I could tell that the noise wasn't something he was familiar with. Had he had any clue regarding what was responsible for the noise, I'm darn sure he would have wanted to head on home right away. Instead, my crazy cousin cracked open another beer. What do you think it is? I said after we heard the noise, again only a minute or two later. Eh, probably a woodpecker, he remarked. Hey, can I get a cigarette? He then said, changing the subject. We each drank another couple of beers while leaning against our four-wheelers, catching each other up on our individual lives and what our families had been up to when I thought. I noticed a human-like shape between two trees. It seemed faint enough to disregard it as a figment of my imagination, and Jimmy was talking his head off. So I returned my attention toward him. In any normal circumstances, I probably would have been a little more freaked out, but I was with a guy who was so comfortable in those woods, I assumed there couldn't be anything to worry about. But soon, something interrupted my confident cousin mid-sentence. Don't move, he said so quietly that it took me a second to consider what he had said. What is it? I asked, but he didn't reply. Instead, he slowly got back on his four-wheeler. That's when I made the mistake of turning around. I should have calmly followed his lead. I didn't allow my eyes to focus on what crept toward us from a few yards behind me. All I saw was that there was a large, shadowy-like figure crawling towards us. It was so low to the ground that I thought it was a panther. But then I heard its powerful bark a split second after Jimmy started his engine. It was so loud and seemed to muffle the sounds of our motors. Go, Jimmy yelled just before punching his gas pedal. I did the same, which made my vehicle hydroplane a bit, nearly causing me to fall off. I followed his lead, panicking, wondering when I'd feel the sensation of another life form ripping me from the handlebars of the vehicle. I did all I could to keep my focus on Jimmy in front of me. After a few minutes of going full speed along the bumpy trail, I started to feel that we were in the clear. But that was when I turned around and saw that the predator was hauling butt towards us. That was when I saw that this was no large cat. As deranged as it sounds, it looked like a muscle-ridden caveman was chasing us on all fours. What in the world? I involuntarily yelped, yet the wind in the engine of our all-terrain vehicle must have muted my voice. Even though I barely glimpsed the face, I knew that there was something at least slightly human to this thing. The revelation was so mind-blowing that it feels like I can't even put it into words. I knew I wasn't dreaming. This was a real-life nightmare, incomparable with anything I'd ever imagined I'd experienced. I felt kind of bad for admitting this, but I remember thinking it was unfair that I was the one in the back during this chase. It should have been Jimmy. Why was it that the one least experienced with these woods was in the back? What had I gotten myself into by so willingly going on this after-dark excursion through such desolate land? It all turned into such a blur after that. I almost couldn't believe it when I found myself parking the small vehicle in the garage. Jimmy had already hopped off by that point and was amid shutting the garage door. When the door finally closed, I was so darn thankful not to have seen some giant hand reach under the door. The sound of it closing was like music to my ears. I had never before heard something so relieving, and I sincerely doubt I ever will again. There was something so overwhelmingly awkward when we stepped inside the house 
Our families were having such a good time with glasses of wine and cheerful conversation. The contrast in their demeanors to ours couldn't have been greater. Both Jimmy and I were sweating profusely, so they asked us what was wrong. Neither of us knew how to put any of it into words. It's interesting how both Jimmy and I told them that we were chased by what looked like a caveman. That happened before we even had a chance to discuss it amongst ourselves. It's not like we have any hard evidence to prove it, but what we saw had to have been a Sasquatch. Otherwise, how would a legitimate caveman lineage have managed to last all these years? And the fact that we heard tree knocks affirms my current belief even further. I don't understand how anyone could actively search for what we encountered that night. That's a suicide mission. That thing wanted human meat. It's because of that disturbing experience that I will never live anywhere near the wood, especially if I had children. Forgive me for saying it, but people who do that come up to me as utterly insane. I wish I could have spoken to Jimmy before writing this report, but I regret to say that he passed away a little over five years ago due to circumstances I'd rather not disclose. He and I did get a chance to discuss the whole thing on several occasions, and it was he who brought to light the probability that what we encountered was a Sasquatch. As frightening as it was, I'm happy he and I got to experience something so out of the norm together. He was wild, but he was a great guy. Rest in peace, Jimmy. We all love you, dude. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!